The group managing director of FBN Holdings says the risk in critical sectors will allow banks play a more active role in Africa's industrialization. CNBC Africa's Kenneth Igbama caught up with him to discuss the role of banks in driving Africa's industrialization. We're in Busan here at the annual meetings of the African Development Bank. Very interesting conversations going so far about you know, how to accelerate you know, Africa's industrialization. I'd like to hear your take on this. Again, thanks, uh, Ken. Um, the past three days uh, have been very exciting and um, it's also been very humbling listening to conversations around Africa and where we are in the scheme of things. And what is clear is that Africa is lagging behind across various metrics and therefore there's a need for us to um, recheck our model of industrialization and also model of development across Africa and apply some level of consistency and then make it action-based so that we can begin to see results. The world clearly has waited for so long for Africa and um, getting out of um, Busan, we should be able to reach consensus on how to develop the continent. What is clear also is that there is no one size fits all. So models will have to be applied you know, on a case by case basis. And just listening to the experience of South Korea, for instance, makes us you know, to, uh, to accept that truly we can leapfrog and be a very strong continent going forward. Talking about leapfrogging, and we look at the, the fourth industrial revolution, a lot of people are saying that Africa, we need to be consistent and deliberate about our planning and our policies. You know, I'd like to hear what you think about this. It's about being competitive, essentially, and laying the building blocks for competitiveness. We are talking about the cost of doing business, and it's not just for Nigeria. It cuts across the entire continent where we cannot compete our factories cannot compete because the customers have to make rational decisions. It's about price, it's about quality. And so when you don't deliver at the right uh, price and at the right uh, quality, the customer makes a call. And so opening the continent to uh, the new economy and also leveraging the mobile uh, technology that has now become commonplace and also building partnerships with global brands who are taking spaces in Africa is the way to go. We need to identify those global players and see how they can begin to set up in, um, in Africa and not just bring in finished goods. That is the point being made. Second point to make is that we need to consciously, consciously across Africa, move away from just shipping primary commodities. The value addition uh, quotient is very, very lim limited, it's very low. And second, or thirdly, we need to also begin to talk about intra-Africa trade. Statistics show that we got about only 11% of global trade or intra-Africa. And so if we are trading amongst ourselves at that level, it means that the entire world cannot take us seriously. We need to open the borders. We need to identify the regional champions, continental champions, that can begin to take very strong positions across African economies and impact the uh, communities around them. The other point to make is identifying the industries that will most impact the population. This is a very youthful population. We've got about 70% of population below 30. How do you engage them? And they have, they have exposure to the internet, to the mobile phones, and so they, they know what the new world is all about. But are we prepared to engage this population? as is, we are not. And so speaking to what can make the economy blossom, identifying the population dynamics and the demographics that have changed, identifying those sectors that can most impact the population, not those that do not have direct impact on the local economies. And I speak to oil and gas and mining, for instance. You cannot domesticate these two sectors effectively because they have external linkages and they've been automated, yet they contribute significantly to African GDPs. So I think going forward, we need to look at those areas, speaking to agriculture, speaking to infrastructure, speaking to roads, power, that can open up the various communities so that we can, we can begin to feel the impact of the new economy. You just mentioned the gorilla in the room, power. You know, if Africa is going to be competitive, you know, we really, really, really need to get that right. I'd like you to speak to that. Clearly, power, is a major contributor to co competitiveness. If you have access to power and you are producing 
quality goods, and then you have the access to evacuate, evacuate your products, then you are halfway into success. Why is this critical? We know that there's automation. We know there's industrialization. These are not things that can be achieved without power. We are going through actual intelligence right now, AI. We are going through robotics. We are going through all of these modern day inventions and they drive on power, essentially. So when we talk about investing in power, it is because it's a critical enabler to industrialization. And across the continent, there is power deficit. And so the investments that have to be made today and now must start with power. Once you are done with that, and then you open up access roads to evacuate products through the railways, which is another critical area, to reduce the cost of doing business and then moving to markets, then you can be sure that the market will be impacted, continent will be impacted. I'm fascinated about the uh, borders that are being opened across Africa. I'm fascinated about the air links that have been developed across Africa. But it's not enough. That speaks to just moving people. But how about producing? Are we producing at a very competitive rate or level? The answer is no. And we believe that government has to partner, create the environment for private sector investors to invest in power and allow them tariff reviews at intervals. The multi-year tariff order has to be implemented. It's important we allow the suppliers of power to adjust rates using commercial rates. Otherwise, the investment will be very minimal and we'll have a electric power supply across the continent. Subsidy may be good, but it's not sustainable. And we've got to make a call on how to develop Africa. If we're talking industrialization, power is central to it. I know how central power is and I know banks have been exposed to to that sector and some of them didn't come out too happy. You know, I like as a, as a banker in the, in, the, in the house, I'd like you to speak to how that exposure in, in that is affecting more investment coming into that sector. So I think the first point is to note that unless you de-risk any sector and all sectors, banks cannot play very active roles. And so the first thing around pricing is very important. How do you allow banks to lend and the producers of power adjust prices when market conditions change, so that speaks to the risking. Second point to make is around the tenure of funds available to banks. We've got to create the opportunity for um, the multilateral lending agencies to come in and partner with African banks whose funds are not really long term. We don't have very patient funds across African banks. And so having funds that can come from even AFDB or Afrexim or World Bank can incentivize banks to lend. Because remember that the funds the banks are keeping are really funds that belong to other I mean, uh, depositors. And if they're short tenured, you cannot use short tenured funds to actually develop long term projects, which is really the concern that uh, we have across Africa. That the funds that have been lent, the exposures that banks have in the power sector are not really patient money. These are short-term deposits, and now you need to either pay back and refinance, or you have to deal with the issue of uh, uh, bad loans. Now, regrettably, most of the exposures that Nigerian banks have, clearly the discos and, of course, the Jenkos are having challenges adjusting tariffs, and we can understand why the social tension that creates and the fact that government seemingly has hands off creates a difficult situation for the Jenkos and the Discos to price appropriately. As the price of crude goes up, as the price of gas goes up, it is almost certain that you have to adjust your price, the price of the power. But when it's not, when it's not happening, that you have a danger. The danger is you become less competitive, you cannot produce, and you sustain losses. When you sustain losses, you shut down, and then the banks come after you. So again, banks will need to look for long-term funds to get into this sector. Government also needs to come in at this stage to support through legislation and enforcement. Very, very critical. 
it's good you're mentioning all the players that are involved in in handling this. You've talked about the banks, you've talked about government. You know, I know the DFIs are also involved in you know helping to create this. But who do you think should lead this charge for industrialization? I'm not going to say that government will lead the charge because clearly that model would have been relevant 50, 60 years ago. The model that speaks to states leading the um, industrialization. We've we'll moved beyond that. I think that private sector players should strive to form partnerships. There are so many global players that can come in agreement with and then begin to now get government to either allow certain um, tax holidays, which then means that in terms of um, paying taxes, you can allow them some leverage to produce for a period without paying taxes. And then after they've normalized and stabilized, they can begin to pay taxes. Two, creating the access road. I talked about infrastructure. Building the roads, building the rail infrastructure to evacuate finished products. So it is going to be collaborative. Government has its role. The private sector has its role. The DFIs, they also have their roles to play. But there has to be the consciousness that is a partnership that should work. Ultimately, the consumers will gain because we are speaking to Africa being competitive. The trade between Europe, European countries, about 60% or so, the trade amongst African uh, countries, 11%, the trade even amongst uh, American states, over 65%. So the point here is that unless and until the governments across Africa see the need to build infrastructure and make the producers, manufacturers more competitive will continue to be dumping grounds because those other economies, OECD, Asia, these are countries that have perfected production processes and they have made it cheaper either through robotics or through automation. And we are still at the uh, elementary stage. And so that's need for support. Again, legislation, fiscal regimes have to be altered to support these producers. The tax regimes have to be looked at and allow infant industries to stabilize and normalize before they begin to get taxed. So the tax rebates and tax concessions will always be enabling tools for companies you know, to uh, uh, leapfrog into, into the future. Finally, um, yes, we're, we're pushing for this drive for industrialization, but there's the till end of the value chain, which is having well-structured markets, malls. Do you think we are sufficiently positioned for the tail end, you know, to absorb all that comes at the tail end of the industrialization process? I think what you speak to is basically a lot around the logistics. Yeah. Okay. And um, we are not going to be fixated around the bricks and mortar if you don't have the malls you don't produce. There are so many models to distribute final uh, products. And so we've got logistic companies that can evacuate and store and hold, in which case you do bulk breaking across various territories. You can have the hub and spoke model where you take it to, the, uh, to a center and then you distribute to the uh, hinterland. That is a model. You also appoint your distributors and create hubs for them. Again, the hub and spoke model can always work. But really and truly, looking into the future, um, we would increasingly see um, improvement in our um, logistic and uh, supply chain management so that you, you don't necessarily have to make massive investments in malls. Yes, they will be there, they will serve their, their purposes, but that is not the primary concern for me. My primary concern is to be competitive. How do you produce at a rate and at a price That's competitive. that can be competitive looking at the imported products? Because as part of globalization and as part of um, WTO, the World Trade Organization protocols, you cannot but have open borders. You have to open up your ports and your country to um, Im imported items. But how do you create the opportunity for the national entities, the national corporates to also produce and also export? So when you have a stable currency, yes, you're going to have foreign direct investors, foreign direct, not foreign portfolio. So I'm speaking to investing in, in the real sector and they will only come in when they believe that it's policy consistency, which has also been lacking. All right? So having policies that are predictable, having policies that can endure, that you can build your financial and economic models around, makes it a lot more exciting for you to transfer your funds to any territory. And those economies in Africa that have exhibited a high degree of policy consistency, they have won. 
those ones that still are unable to stand very firmly on policies over a long period, you have seen exit of investments from those territories. And so to the African market, we speak to one, having leadership that understands that we've got to create the country that we all desire to have at each country level. As a continent, there has to be that understanding by the African Union, working in concert, working in concert by the heads of government that they need to create policies that can cut across so that as you open borders, there is some degree of convergence in policies. And that way, you can begin to empower the entire population. Because clearly, there is huge opportunity in Africa. And the market is so big that if we only get the policies right and produce competitively here, the intra-African trade can easily jump to 50%. And that means empowerment. That speaks to employment of the youthful, youthful population. That means to enhance the purchasing power and makes the continent a lot richer. That was UKAK Group Managing Director, FBN Holdings, speaking with CNBC Africa's Kenneth Igbomo.